This is the all new 2023 Suzuki Grand Vitara Mild Hybrid. It's currently costing 270,000 TT fully loaded. But first, how did I get up to the showroom so quickly? If you've been following me for a while, you know that I had a previous gen Suzuki Grand Vitara. Now, when they dropped the Grand Vitara nameplate in favor for the Vitara, I wasn't too interested. I considered it to be a baby Grand Vitara and it never piqued my interest. So imagine my surprise when I heard that they were bringing back the Grand Vitara nameplate. I just had to see so it. So I started calling the showroom because I'm interested. I wanted one. So I got a chance to go up and take a look at it and here it is. 5 feet 10 inches in width. It has a length of 14.5 feet, a height of 5.39 feet and ground clearance of 21 centimeters with a fuel tank that is 45 liters in volume. Now if you're like me, seeing it for the first time you may say to yourself but it looks almost the same size as the previous generation Vitara and that is actually accurate because the previous generation Vitara is only 0.5 feet shorter than the new model Grand Vitara. When it comes to width, it's only 20 millimeters or 0.065 feet more narrow than the new Grand Vitara and in height it's only 35 millimeters shorter. So dimensions on the outside they are almost the same in terms of size and when you look at them side by side you can tell that they have the same dimensions the human eye isn't going to perceive that half a foot difference here that 20 millimeter difference there they look the same size from the outside but that is where the similarities end because taking a look at the outside you can tell that this isn't a facelift Vitara and it isn't an incremental upgrade either it's a complete clean sheet redesign it's actually designed by Suzuki but produced by Toyota starting with the lighting assembly up front as you can see it's segmented the headlights are actually at the bottom and the the daytime running lights and the turn signals are on top. They share one housing on top and they switch. As you can see, the daytime running lights are now off, the turn signals are on. And when the turn signals are off, the daytime running lights will come back on and that's how they operate. The headlights are at the bottom. It's reminiscent of something similar to what the ugly Nissan Duke did a couple of years ago where it had the indicators to the top and the headlights at the bottom but in my opinion this is a much better design it's a much better layout and implementation of that separated headlight assembly system i like how it looks when you see it up close it really looks futuristic now that same lighting system carries over to the back as you can see there's one constant lighting strip where it's separated by the trunk of course but when you see it lighting up it looks like one lighting strip that goes all the way around and it has that three segmented lighting system just like the front now one thing i do not like is how they put the reverse lights and the indicators at the bottom here now i understand because i'll get more into this later on this vehicle is weird by design things that we may consider weird is because of what this vehicle is targeted for but i still don't like how they have it at the bottom here now getting into the trunk the trunk and the separator lifts up as one now you can move the separator if you want more space and fold along the rear seats now in the back here it definitely has more room than the previous generation Vitara so if you are room conscious it has more room now one thing they changed from the Grand Vitara of yesteryear to now is that the spare tire is now located inside here versus being outside on the tailgate and also it is a full size spare same 17 inch rim however it's a steel rim it's not the exact rim on the outside of the vehicle so you do get a full size but not a full size like what's outside you have a pocket at the bottom here above here you have what seems to be a vent then you have a cigarette lighter or a power outlet and you have a bright light this leg is actually super and bright you can see to the rear of the seats has those hooks in case you are transporting something that needs to be hooked on there and yes the rear seats do fold long in the conventional 60 40 split most vehicles if not all do it these days now stepping inside of the grand material there's not much to discuss in the rear the seats are wide they are comfortable this is a fully loaded version so it has leather front and rear that that's really about it other than that you do get rare ac vents and you do get dual power outlets in the form of usb and if you realize all the outlets so far have been covered and everything just seems big and, and unrefined and this goes into the weirdness of this vehicle if you all don't remember the grand vitara is a capable off-road vehicle the Grand Vitara is mainly sold in developing markets. It is made to go off-road if need be, or go on smooth road if you are lucky like that. And you can tell that Suzuki knows their targeted demographic because even the new generation, even though it may look futuristic on the outside, 
You can tell by the interior that they understand that this vehicle in certain countries will be going off-road. And that is why when you compare the interior, it may look dated, especially when you compare this interior to something like a Hyundai Tucson, where everything is a touchscreen, the infotainment system, the GPS, the AC controls, and you even compare it to something like the Kia Sportage, same thing, large screens going all around. Now they look good, they look nice, however, all these screens are going to be useless on the trail, especially all these itty bitty, small, refined, elegant looking touch points are going to be useless when you're on the trail bouncing around trying to hit the volume. That is why when you look at the Suzuki Grand Vitara, everything is just large and big and rugged. There's a wireless charging pad at the bottom there, but look at the USB. The USB to the front is covered just like the rear. The 12 volt power outlet is also covered just like the rear. The traction control, the parking aids, all these things are big and chunky so when you are on the trail and you're bouncing around you can hit that button precisely i'm going for this button beep, and you hit that button look at the ac controls it's not even dials it's toggles you have to hit it up or down so you can tell i'm pushing up now i'm pulling down now but even if you are not planning on going off-road large big buttons help when you are driving you can touch it without taking your eyes off the road versus these small little touch points you have to touch it here and if you touch it over there you wouldn't read big buttons have this purpose and I think this vehicle shows that really well. Now it does have a large touch screen like most vehicles do these days, the tablet style on top of the dash. But the one thing I noticed, especially from a Suzuki, everything, look at it, I'm touching it and there's literally no delay, no lag whatsoever. You hit something and it just responds. And again, this is important for just everyday driving, not even off-roading, everyday driving. You want to know that when you hit a button, it's going to react right away. You don't want to hit it and then have a wonder, did I press it? Then you have to take your eyes off the road to confirm you pressed it. It just hit, boom, right away. Anything you touch. Here you can see I'm demoing the parking sensors and the 360 camera. And it does this cool animation that I will show in a while. But you can look around the vehicle. You can see to the left, you can see to the right, you can see forward, you can see back. Or you can turn it into the 360 view and see right or wrong at the same time. This is really helpful. But when you put on the camera for the first time, it does this whole animation that I think is pretty, pretty cool. And added to that, you can hit a button and it erases the vehicle from the screen. So it seems like you are looking through the vehicle. This is really useful. You are off-roading. You want to know where all those pointy, dangerous, destroy your tire rocks are. You can literally almost see through the vehicle, except the bottom part, of course, and see exactly where you are. Over to the instrument cluster now. Now, you all know I love a vehicle with an all-digital layout. Now, this vehicle doesn't have it. It has the conventional analog with a small screen in the middle. But getting back to what this vehicle is geared for, I think it's right up its alley. The numbers are big enough, you can read it at a glance. Plus, behind every number, you have this little stroke. So you can tell, you can further tell where the needle is relative to the number, your RPM, your speed. And then in the center, you have this small screen that shows other things like who was not wearing a seatbelt at the rear. You can have your clock, your mileage, your distance, how much the hybrid battery has been charged and everything. And again, as you can see, everything is well spaced out and well laid out. So at a glance, you can see precisely what has taken place. Now on the steering wheel, you have your normal controls like most vehicles have. Your hands-free controls are at the bottom there. Volume up, down, navigation keys to change, things on the instrument cluster, your horn in the center. Plus, this vehicle does have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, so you can control that from your steering wheel as well. Now, at the rear of the steering wheel, you have paddle shifters. And in a vehicle like this, which is supposed to be a hybrid, though it's a mild hybrid, I would oftentimes say you don't really need paddle shifters. It's, it's a gimmick. But trust me, in this vehicle, you need those paddle shifters. But I will talk more about that in the driving portion. But for now, just keep in mind that those paddle shifters actually have a purpose in this vehicle. Over to the right of the steering wheel, just by where the driver's knee would be, you have your push to start button. Now, as you can see, it's in the center of a big round indentation. So your finger just generally flows to the center there to start the vehicle. Below that, you have a headlight beam adjustment. In most vehicles that I've tested, this button adjusts where the beam falls on the road. You can either point it lower down or higher up. To the left of that, you have your camera button. This camera button shows what I was showing previously, the 360 camera view. Then you have your hill descent. When you press that hill descent button, it activates hill descent, obviously. Now, the last of the important buttons has to be the HUD, heads up display. When you push that button, the heads up display pops up just behind the steering wheel in view of the driver. And this is what it looks like. You can see things like speed, 
how your battery has been charging, RPM, and different things like that. This is how it looks while you are stationary and while you are driving. This is what you would see. Right now, it's set to speed and time, and you can see the DDF in drive. So I know I'm in drive. I'm going 18 kilometers an hour, and the time is below it. Now, as I said, you can change it to different things, but this is what it's set to currently. And when not in use, it just folds down and hides away neatly behind the steering wheel on top of the dash. When it comes to soft touch material and build quality, you don't get much soft touch material. On top here, here is a kind of hard piano black finish, very glossy. You have a center console, you can store stuff there. And on top of that, when you fold down the top, you have this is where the soft touch material is it's slightly soft because most people put their hands on top there. So, you know, this has to be soft in every vehicle you ever touch. If it's not soft, something is wrong. On top here, it's not hard, it's a type of velvet plastic. It is hard plastic, but it's a type of velvet plastic. On top here, Hard plastic on the dash, velvet type material in the middle here. Over here, again, hard plastic. Now, it doesn't feel like cheap hard plastic, but you can tell it is hard plastic. And all of this lends itself nicely given the fact that the Grand Vitara feels comfortable off-road as well as on the road. So everything is rugged. Here you can see vanity mirror for both driver and passenger. Now, if you're looking at the gear shifter assembly and you're saying to yourself, why does it look like it has so much extra space on either side? That is because this is essentially a manual shift gate. There is a manual variant to this available in different markets. So the shift gate has to be wide enough to accommodate the shifting of gears. So the essentially just move the manual component from the center, shoves an automatic component in the middle there. And that is why you have so much excess space around. All it did was change the shift piece and the shift lever. That's about it. Just below that, you have your 4x4 controls because this vehicle is all grip after all. Suzuki is legendary all grip. You have two large cup holders and you have a manual, what we now call conventional type handbrake. No foot brake, no electronic parking brake, none of that. Just a conventional handbrake. You pull it and it pulls a long cable and activates the brake. Up top, where you have your dome lights and stuff, you have your automatic dimming rear view mirror. You have a place to put your sunglasses in the center there, just like most vehicles do. You have your lighting controls. You can use the switch to turn both lights on at the same time. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way. If you want one side on only, you can push it and it comes on just like that. Again, most vehicles have adopted this right now. You can either put both of them on like this or you can press it again and take them off individually. And well, that's it for the interior. The biggest downside about this entire interior is that the version that we are getting in Toronto Tobago does not come with a sunroof. There are versions out there that come with giant sunroofs, but for some reason, our market is frowned upon so much that we never get the cool stuff. And I think it's time that the dealers in Toronto Tobago push back a bit on these manufacturers. Stop sending the non-cool stuff down here. Now, all that aside, how does the Grand Vitara drive? Well, it drives as you would expect an SUV like this to drive. You sit up high, you have a commanding view of the road, visibility is great, and the suspension really surprised me because even though this vehicle is the underpinnings, is that of off-roading, you can't take it off-roading if you really wanted to or if you had to. The suspension is really compliant. This road, though it isn't the worst, it also isn't the best. There are some bumps and road undulations that the suspension really soaks up. It soaks it up nicely. You don't feel like you are wiggling or bumping around the road. But at the same time, you understand that you are on a bumpy road. Now, all along here, I'm driving and the salesrep is talking to me. Really nice young lady. She's talking to me and she's selling me on the vehicle. She's talking about the different trim levels, the features, stuff like that. And I'm really enjoying the drive. So far, I was going to give this vehicle a 9 out of 10. But then there's an elephant in the room and the elephant in the room only rears its ugly head when you get out onto the highway. And that elephant in the room has to be the underpowered engine that the new Grand Vitara has. Because it is powered by a naturally aspirated 1.5 liter mild hybrid engine that produces just about 101 horsepower and just about 102 foot pounds of torque. Every article I read gave these figures and I'm really and truly hoping I'm wrong. But given how this vehicle drives, allow me to put that into perspective for you. If you were at a traffic light with your brand new Suzuki Grand Vitara and next to you was a Toyota RAV4 with its 2 litre engine, a Hyundai Tucson with its 1.6 turbo engine, a Kia Sportage with its 1.6 turbo engine and even a Kia Rio with its naturally aspirated 1.4 litre engine and all of you with a float, 
you would get beaten by all of them. But I'm not done yet. Because if in that lineup had a one liter three cylinder turbocharged Toyota race, you were still going to get beaten off the line to 100 kilometers an hour. And here's the thing. Even an underpowered engine is capable of pulling the vehicle. You can wring any underpowered engine's neck and get power from it. You may have to accelerate harder, go all the way down, red line, but the point is you can get the power. The issue with the Grand Vitara, in my experience, has to be the fact that however the transmission is programmed, it doesn't gear down as aggressively as a normal vehicle would. For example, you are driving from a B road like this and you are trying to go onto the highway. So you will have to accelerate to match the speed of oncoming cars. In a normal vehicle, you accelerate harder, you floor it, you do what I had to do, and your transmission will at least gear down one or two gears to give you that oomph to accelerate. This doesn't do it. The Grand Vitara has six gears and it just holds on to that six gear for their life. Let me give you an example using that same scenario I just showed you there. Keep in mind, what you are seeing here is me flooring it. As you can see, X the board, the RPM goes up slightly and it just refuses to automatically gear down to 5th, 4th, 3rd. That is why the paddle shifters are so important. For example, I had to manually take control and gear down to 2 in order to come out onto the highway and get some kind of oomph. But what is surprising, I hit the downward paddle once. Which means if I'm in 2 now, I was in 3 before, the vehicle was struggling to accelerate in 3rd gear. This is the problem with this naturally aspirated 1.5 litre mild hybrid. And the thing about it is, a mild hybrid is a baby hybrid. It's in no way comparable to the Honda Vessel or all the Nissan Note e-powers, even a Toyota Aqua. It's not even in that category. I do not understand why they chose to bring the mild hybrid instead of the strong hybrid as Suzuki calls it. It's baffling to me. Maybe there are some things behind the scenes I would not be able to understand, but I am baffled by it. The strong hybrid at least would have given you at least 10 more, maybe 15 more horsepower or something. This mild hybrid just isn't doing it for me. The, the trade-offs, right, because essentially what a mild hybrid is, is just giving you slight fuel economy increase off the line. And granted, when you are at a standstill and you pull off, you do not feel sluggish with the vehicle. Once you are in first gear, second gear, you do not feel sluggish. It pulls like a normal vehicle. The issue arises once you are up to speed past 50, 60 kilometers an hour and it reaches into that top gear, sixth gear, it just refuses to automatically go down. I would have loved the Grand Vitara a lot more had they just shoved the naturally aspirated 1.6 litre engine under the hood. Give me 130 horsepower, 140 foot pounds of torque and I would have been very happy. I still like the vehicle. I'm still considering getting one. I'm not going to get the fully loaded. I'm not going to spend $270,000 to get passed by everything on the road. That is for sure. I'm going to get the base model, I don't need the four wheel drive, and I'm going to be content. That long, excessive, but really and truly needed engine rant aside, let's end on being a passenger. Because like I said, I got a chance to ride in the back seat, the rear of the vehicle, and it's really roomy. As you can see, the both front seats are pushed back, and the guy next to me and myself, we have a lot of room. You know, it's, it's not a cramped space. It's a nice space. You can take your family for a long drive, a long, slow drive, but it's going to be a nice, long, comfortable drive. And I think that is why I am so pissed off with that engine decision. Because Suzuki almost had the perfect vehicle. It's elegant. It's nice looking depending on what your taste is. It can go off-road, you know, Trinidad likes to flood, so it can go through the water. It, it was almost perfect. And then someone who clearly should have been fired a long time ago decided, you know what? Let me put an underpowered engine in here. And let's make it not a useful hybrid, but a mild hybrid. Just to get the hybrid badge at the back. And one last thing. I have a suspicion that they are going to phase out the Vitara and replace it with this, the Grand Vitara. Because they are almost at the same price point, probably about four or five thousand dollars different between the trim levels. And this is a far superior vehicle to that. So I think they are going to phase out that and replace it with this. But only time will tell. 